can change the world. Taking care of the world's health practitioners, Intra Health's Pop Guy. Pop, welcome back. Thank you very much, Stan. It's I, nice to be back. I, I say welcome back because we met first we at did. CGI 2012, and here we, we are did. at CGI 2013. And we're not going to do exactly the same thing as we did, but for people who are watching this for the first time, tell us a little bit about but, Intra Health. Uh, yeah, Intra Health um, is a, an international NGO, health NGO, uh, which grew out of a, a program of the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Uh, we like to say that our mission is to champion the healthcare worker. Mm -hmm. uh, making sure that she is understood, she the the systems in which she or he operates is uh, is uh, very well prepared to receive her services. Mm -hmm. And uh, we work in about 30 countries uh, over the years. We have worked in about 100 countries, but currently we're active in about 30 countries. And those 30 countries are they primarily on one continent? No, they are uh, predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa, but mm. but also in Asia and in Central America. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest challenge of the health worker today in uh, in the areas where you work? Where where we work? Well, the, the the one that everybody likes to talk about is the shortage. I mean, there is a crisis. The shortage of healthcare. The shortage workers. of healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a global shortage of about uh, 4.2 million health workers. Um, worldwide and um, unfortunately many of the countries that have a severe crisis uh, are in sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. Mm -hmm. When you say severe crisis and, and I, I heard you put a lot of emphasis on severe, mm -hmm. um, that sounds really bad. It is. Tell me about that. It is. Well the World Health Organization has just come up with a criteria that um, an acceptable standard is to have uh, 2.4 health workers per 1,000 inhabitants. Um, the majority, the 57 countries we're talking about have on the average 0 0.4 to 0 0.5. Oh my gosh. So it's, it, is, it is a severe crisis, yes. What does a healthcare worker do in a country of sub-Saharan Africa? Is there any, let's just take an, an example country. Um, well, the way I like to describe it is that the, a health worker is the link between the systems we're trying to put in place, i.e. I. the products, the medicine, the information, and the community we try to serve. I think the best definition I'd like to give is that a health worker is really the human face of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also the, the link between the systems and the community. And uh, he or she is the one that is closer to the population and is more likely to encourage the population to use those services that are available, which is not always the case, unfortunately. You talk about uh, that the healthcare worker, the ones you're talking about, are the mm -hmm. ones who uh, are um, helping to, to provide a link between the system and, and the, the person. Yes. What, what systems are we talking about? Um, I recently saw actually a, a, a very simple depiction of what the system is because people tend to get bogged into the word system. That uh, Yep, me too. Yeah, people think about infrastructure and building. Um, I think the best way to say it is that it takes several elements to make a system. And in those... WHO has actually identified six pillars which actually characterize what, what makes up the system. Mm -hmm. One is the human resources for health, so you do need the people to do the work and that's where the health workers come. The other one is um, uh, the drugs, the drugs and the supplies and so forth. Another one is the service delivery because there are several ways of delivering these services. One is the information, information mm -hmm. about the services that's available, information about the customers, information about the patients, and so forth. Uh, one is around the notion of leadership and governance, because it is now recognized that in order to have performing system, you really need the right leadership. Uh, this is important because in a lot of the developing countries, that for the longest time has been left to the donors and the donor communities to figure that out. 
Really? Exactly. So, uh, so, so the leadership of the very important system of healthcare inside a country has been left up to an NGO? For, uh, to an NGO or to some donors or to some... So I think... Or maybe not even the NGO itself, maybe just, maybe just, just the donors? Just, maybe just the donors. I oh think there's goodness. been a lot, of ex a lot of expectation that the World Health Organization itself will be a good provider of leadership. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have this kind of a taken a very passive approach. Mm. So why why is that so? Why uh, is that a statement that you know the healthcare of of a nation is not important? Uh, I would hate to think that, and uh, and that is certainly it. Uh, the reality would lead very easily to that. But I just think that it's on the face of in the face of poverty and competing priorities when you had a system whereby some, someone was willing to spend resources and effort into making sure that these systems are solid, governments just um, use their other rare resources on something else, mm -hmm. like food or food, product, food production or food security or uh, some education mm -hmm. or some other sectors. Well, you just opened up a big door for me uh, <laughs> talking about food security. Just yes. how important is uh, food security nutrition for the health worker? Oh, I, I think it's crucial. Uh, it, it, you know, that is actually one thing I'm so excited about these days because as we begin to talk about the post-MTG, mm -hmm. the next round of goals, whether they'll be sustainable goals or whatever, there is now more willingness, in my opinion, to look at an integrated approach to things. So in other words, let's not just look at health, let's look at everything that has to do with health, but even other sectors. Now that is forcing us to think about an issue like nutrition. Because I think it is fair to say that up to now, or until now, nutrition tends to be in the back burner. I think it is something that donors fund, uh, that's something that countries had a tendency to think really as an afterthought. Um, but I think it's extremely important. And as we're focusing on the health workforce, um, I was telling at, a, at an event last night that it is actually too bad that we tend to focus so much on the shortage. If we work with the health workers that we have, and if we manage to get the best out of the health workers that we have, in fact we can solve a lot of the problems that we think we have because of that shortage. And I think one of those elements actually is nutrition. Hmm. And, and specifically for these health workers, nutrition for themselves to make sure that um, they are prepared because I think the analogy is very, very simple. In order to go and fight a robust fight, you need to be ready. Yeah. And health workers are fighting a very tough battle. Hmm. Uh, they are trying to get health care to the poorest, to the neediest of the world. And unfortunately, uh, they are very vulnerable. They are very mm -hmm. vulnerable because of, of the poor working conditions, but also because no one really pay attention to their well-being. So I think beginning to pay attention to the well-being of the health workers is extremely important and paying a little bit more attention to nutrition would be very, very beneficial. And encouraging them to embrace more nutrition and more promotion of food security. And the way to do that, in my opinion, is to embrace this integrated approach to development. You know, it's, it's interesting that you <coughs> say that because um, with organizations that, that I am very closely familiar with, Hunger and poverty are inextricably linked, yeah. and it seems to me that a natural part of hunger and poverty comes health care. Yep. Um, yep. And at the you know at the same point in time, the the countries, some of which you probably work in, that that I've been in, I see a tremendous amount of food being grown. Yeah. 
but because of poor preservation, um, yeah. I see a tremendous amount of food being lost. Oh, being lost. Yeah. And so the opportunity for nutrition is there. Yeah. It's just the technologies are not available or something. Yeah, I think it's a combination of both the technology, I think the attention, uh, I think uh, certainly yeah, lack of lack of education. I think I think if we who tend to focus on, on health care workers, if we increased the level of education and the promotion of nutrition as a as a really crucial intervention. I think we would get some some results. For well, the for the past several years, mm -hmm. uh, not just at CGI but all across the world, there has been a focus on on women, mm -hmm. uh, women and girls, women's mm -hmm. health, mm -hmm. uh, women's nutrition, and and just j the fact that the the woman has in many places a much bigger role, certainly mm -hmm. in the family, than what they get credit for. That's right. But also, I've noticed that with regard to women's health. There's been a direct focus and care for, yeah. um, you know, particularly, I don't know if it's returning or, or, or rejecting old traditions, mm -hmm. uh, particularly female uh, genital mutilation, mm -hmm. circumcision. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that your healthcare workers mm -hmm. have to deal with mm -hmm. constantly. Mm -hmm. But they've got to deal with it, not just from the health aspect, but from the cultural yep. aspect too. That's right. How do you do that? Um, very difficult, very difficult, but um, it is, you know, you, you've mentioned female genital cutting, um, which is clearly something you're not going to eradicate uh, so simply without looking at all the other social determinant, social factors. And uh, it's it is very clear that unless you spend some time in the social, cultural, religious environment that promote these practices, you ain't going to get far. Um, I like to give the example of Mali, which is a country where I think the prevalence rate of female genital cutting is upward of 90 percent. Oh my gosh. Upward of 90 percent. So. What we have found out a few years back uh, when we did our study is that a similar proportion of healthcare workers went through female genital cutting themselves. Mm. And um, so you are dealing with people who have their set of values, who, who were raised uh, with the belief that this is a normal part of life. And so it takes a lot of education and a lot of emphasis on understanding all of these um, these factors, and um, so which makes it really a a very long term approach. Um, I know even here in CGI we have groups like Tostan in Senegal focusing on, on um, helping communities abandon the practice and, and all of that. So uh, you go, this is why this whole idea, and I heard the Minister of Health of Senegal just a couple of hours ago say this, uh, how important it was for, them, for her as Minister of Health to work much more closely with Ministers of Social Affairs, Ministry of Education, because she agrees that it is she is not the minister of medicine hmm. uh, which I thought was was very very well done so that is one of the challenges we have as we try to prepare the next generation of health workers because I'm of a belief that whatever set of goals we have post MDG whether they'll be sustainable development goals it's going to take an integrated approach and an integrated mind. But it's going to take for us to act on that, because I think we have known for a while now that we needed to have this understanding of things all come together. Mm. But I think it's even going to be more urgent um, if we don't want to take 
another 20 years to achieve these goals. If we want to leapfrog, if we want to really use the technology that we have in our hands and so forth. All right, so you're talking about an integrated approach. Others talk about it in, in a holistic way. That's right. But, but the bottom line is that people working together to address the biggest social problems. Yes. Since they've never done that before, yes. how is that going to happen? Um, it, it's, an, it's an excellent question. Um, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to take a few champions um, who are going to be the catalyst. It's going to take a few countries, a, a handful of countries, because that is really what we, how we're seeing things work. Where are the champions going to come from? Are they going to come from government? They're going to come from healthcare? Are they going to come from education? Where are they going to come from? You know, I think we have already some government ones, but I think they're going to come from civil society. They're going to come from civil society because that's the voice we are missing right now. Um, I think we are talking a lot about it, but um, I'm saying it's going to come from civil society because that's where you're going to find the people, the champions, that are going to be there for the communities and for the people. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be a little bit more objective. They're going to be less invested in terms of we are the leader or we are the guardian of the health of the people in the case of government or we are from the private sector and we have a private motives. But uh, but people who are really into raising their voice, into making sure that the government is accountable for what they say they're going to do, making sure that these services that we're supposed to provide to the community are provided. So I think that's what it, I think they are kind of waiting. I think I think we're beginning to hear them. I think we're beginning to hear very smart voices. Um, I think they're going to come from these communities. I think they're going to come from these health workers. Uh, we are beginning to, to notice that some of them are coming out and raising their voice. About three weeks uh, last year, I was at an event where I heard a midwife got up on the stage of this event that we have to address a community of social entrepreneurs who focus on use of technology. Mm -hmm. And she was telling them that she wants these technologies to help her do her job. She does not just want fancy technology that are created because it's, you know, it's, it looks sophisticated and so forth, but she gets it back to what is it that she's really doing, which is trying to solve global health problems. We need voices like Tembi, who are going to be able to tell people uh, that the innovation that you're coming up need to make sense. Um, we're going to need to to hear people saying to these health workers uh, or to these governments, you've committed to put 15% of your um, budget into health. Why aren't you doing it? Uh, so that's why I think that's where mm -hmm. I think they're going to come from. Well, I'm looking at a rainmaker. <laughs> you are. <laughs> but I don't think what you just described, you're going to be the champion because you don't live in the community. Uh, Correct. But if you did, you would yes. definitely, definitely be, be a Correct. champion. Correct. That's, that's Correct. For sure. Correct. But we certainly can, can, can encourage and catalyze and, uh, and uh, you know, and, 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 and be ready to listen because I think it does take being in that predisposition, mm -hmm. in that in that state of mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more question: um, yeah. the the healthcare worker who is at in the last mile. Yeah. Um, how long does that person normally do that job? On the average, um, I think currently, unfortunately, we're seeing an average of fifteen years or so. Wow, 15 years. I would not have been surprised if you had said two. Really? Yeah. Oh, no. No, I think we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of turnovers. We have a lot of, but I think, I think they tend to be overestimated because I don't consider somebody who leaves the private sector to take a job 
in the faith-based organization or in the private sector to be completely lost to the system. You see, we tend to see these statistics which are slightly misleading. Um, so I, I do think we have, we have an average. I mean, a doctor rarely will leave the profession entirely. I mean, we, we've got cases. We've got cases, especially in terms of the brain drain, people who, you know, leave their countries, come to New York and end up driving taxis and so forth. I think we covered that last year. But they are still the exception. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think the people that embrace the health profession do it for the passion because they, that's, and they, and they end up spending, spending a great deal of their, of their career. Bob Guy, thank Stan, you very much for being here. My, my pleasure, my pleasure. Thank Take you care, for Dad. having us again. Thank you. Pop Guy, intra Take care. Rainmaker believes we can change the world. One life, one heart, one soul, one mind at a time.